Hi everyone and welcome to the Montessori Show. I'm Simone Davis and this is Jeanne-Marie Penel uh, from Paris today. Usually I'm in San Diego, but I am stranded in Paris for now <laughs> due to this global pandemic, but it's not a bad, bad place to be stranded. So I'm not going to complain. I'm good. No, no, but I still think that it would be nice to be able to book an airline ticket and get yourself home when you like to go home. So Exactly. At least know, know when I'm, I'm going to be able to go. So, yes. And it's Hello. Really today's uh, workshop uh, because we're going to be talking about parenting in challenging times. And it is challenging times. It has been, 2020 has been a bit of a year, right? So it we've started been. off with bushfires in Australia, then into the pandemic, then uprisings in the U.S., um, and just everyone become doing a lot of deep work on themselves and it's then some more bushfires in the US. It's um, been a roller coaster and thank you all for just being here and showing up and doing the work and we're all just, you know, doing the best that we can. Um, I'd like to just say up front that Jean-Marie and I, neither of us have ever been through this time before. So we are going to do our best <laughs> to apply the most principles um, as we would have them, you know, in unusual circumstances. and staying as calm and guiding our children even when we're uncertain ourselves so Jean-Marie do you want to add anything else before we get started no I just love that you that you reminded that you know we're all we're all in this together it's it's this is this is a, you know a very unusual time for for everybody and not even not even our elders have been through it so you know I see I've been here in Paris with my my father who's who's older and he's, you know, he's completely perplexed and just, you know, it's, it's, it's there. They can't even tell us how to deal with the situation that we're in. So it's really about us. Uh, I think giving ourselves grace that this is, this is very unusual and that we need to take it, you know, one day at a time slowly and be, be kind to ourselves, be kind to each other. So those of you who are new to the Montessori show, Jean-Marie and I have been doing this for the last four and a half years, um, meeting first via Google, I think it was, and lately more on Zoom. Um, and we love this um, format because we can see your faces, you can unmute yourselves to ask your questions, you can drop questions in the chat box, and people have already sent in a lot of questions as well. We're going to start with the questions that relate more to the pandemic or the current situation. And then if we have time, we'll deal with the other ones that have come in as well which um, there's a lot of people struggling right now. So I think that's really interesting. And in the chat box, you're welcome to drop in where you're joining us from. We've got um, Jenny calling in from Virginia, Selena from Munich in Germany, Isabella in Lithuania, Mariana in San Diego, Chile, um, another, oh, it's San Diego, Houston, South Carolina, Indianapolis, California, and Lebanon. So wow. we just a small group of people. There's at least 20 of us on the call. Yes in the globe quite well so that's pretty fun it is i'm i'm always just so i just love how how international how global this community is so thank you all for being here and i think that's actually one of the things i'd like to say the upside of the down is that being in these zoom rooms and in lots of learning and professional development right now i have I've loved connecting with our Montessori community around the globe. And I'm not sure if any of you got to join Jean-Marie and I um, for Montessori Everywhere that happened um, to celebrate Dr. Montessori's 150th birthday. Cheers, Dr. Montessori, <laughs> in your honor. Um, but I can drop a link to that um, as well. Um, if you'd like to go back, there's still recordings available for the panel discussions and for the beautiful celebration events that took part. Um, and that was just such a wonderful way to connect. So, um, so I just, I just have to say one thing about that. Simone is being very humble about this whole Montessori everywhere, but she basically put this whole uh, event, 12 hours of celebration of panel discussions and all of this in, in less than a month, uh, just gathering people and just, it, it was just a very beautiful way of celebrating, uh, you know, Dr. Montessori's work and, and just kudos to you, Simone, for, for having pulled that off. 
Well, it was a group of 10 of us in the end, but I did have the silly idea and, no. we, all, <laughs> and we laughed a lot and it was really just a joy to get to work with everyone. Um, so Sarana said she'd love to see the recordings and Dara and Tijinda, hello, they're from my classes. They'd like to see them too. All right, so let's get in. Jean-Marie, I'm going to read you the first question. You can go first today. Okay. And this is, um, one about homeschooling. Um, they're starting to homeschool their three-year-old and wondering which manuals to use, NAMC, R&D, others. Also, how do you respond to toddlers screaming using the Montessori approach? Okay, so let's stick with the homeschooling one to start with. So for me, Montessori uh, homeschooling, I will, I will be very uh, Frank, I never homeschooled my children. I sent them off to school. I worked in a Montessori classroom. So homeschooling is kind of very new to me. And I think the whole manual and all of this, it's going to be what feels right to you. But I don't necessarily believe for the three-year-old that you you know, necessarily need specific manuals. There are a lot of wonderful support groups right now going on, some on Facebook, some are membership. Uh, there is actually the Montessori Homeschool Summit that is going to start October 5th. There it's uh, a lot of homeschooling families who are coming together and, and kind of sharing things. I'm participating, but more on the positive discipline side. So for me, I'm going to say, I don't know what is the best manual. I think it's going to be the one that speaks to you, the one that, that, that you know, is going to support you in your, in your endeavors. But I think you need to, you know, ask yourselves why, why homeschooling. So, so today, a lot of us don't even have the opportunity to ask why we're just being confronted with having to so it i think what's most important is really finding uh other homeschooling parents uh preferably if you're doing montessori other montessori homeschool parents so that you can support each other so you can help each other because there's going to be one parent that is going to you know know more about the the math sequence maybe and somebody else is going to know more about the language sequence so really coming together and i think it will also help you as a parent to have that support yeah and i think that just in general like before we were all forced into homeschooling um, I'm not sure if manuals would be the best way to go about it because I've read books with presentations and it's kind of very robotic in how it's presented. And I think we sometimes miss the big part of Montessori is like Montessori is about following the child and following their interests and slowing down and letting the child decide when and how homeschooling is going to look um, and those kind of things. And so a manual like, and particularly at three years old, I think I agree with Jean-Marie that I don't know if you necessarily need a manual in these formal lessons because it would be more like, how can we do practical life activities? How could we introduce mathematical concepts of like counting and those kind of things in a playful way um, without it being too serious? And particularly because we're not sure how long it might be for. Um, and if you're going down that way, and if you were really going to do homeschooling, I really think a Montessori training or at least an assistance training would be highly beneficial because really to open the books, get guidance, get the full um, robust beginning, that will really underpin then everything else that you do. And you'll be able to apply the Montessori concepts, even if it's not exactly by a manual. So that would be my idea. Just it's yes. really about living with your child. I kind of do like the idea of unschooling in a way, because that in a way is Montessori to me. It's kind of like, you're just learning by living. And so I think in these times, that's what we can do when we can't do many other things. Because it's not really realistic to go and buy all the Montessori materials and have them in our homes. Um, you know, and it works so well in a Montessori um, classroom when you've got older children modeling for younger children. And if you are going to homeschool with a family um, or with, you know, children in your area and things, then that may be a reason to go and buy some of the materials. But I really love um, also there's, a beautiful homeschooling um, workshop that Trillium Montessori has for the three to six year old and the six to 12 year old. So one's run by Jana Herman um, and the other is by Letty Rising. And they're really about how you can apply these Montessori principles without actually all the materials. So yes. those are very reasonable as well. So I can put those links into the show. I, and, and I think actually they're both going to be uh, in the homeschooling summit. I know 
Uh, I know Letty is, and I know somebody else. So I think I would definitely start there to to get ideas and support, and and you know join the Facebook group and get kind of those answers. But like Simone says, it's really more about just living with your child. Really, a three year old is is you know so wanting to do what you're doing in practical life and and so on. So really, follow your child. In fact, John, where you actually did a workshop with me, the Montessori yes. Preschoolers workshop, yes. would also be a really great resource for people in this situation because it was Definitely. about what does the preschooler need right now and how can you do that in the home? So that actually could be a perfect solution too. So let me drop the note, um, the link to that as well. Yes. Preschoolers in the show notes as well. And, and, and please, if there's anybody on the call that is you know is homeschooling or or is also trained and has ideas please also drop them in the chat i think it's you know the more ideas that we have to support each other the better so ah heather's actually on the call so that's great she was the one who asked and she said she loved the idea of going through a training thank you for the recommendation and um the ami actually are doing their assistance training online right now so it was really fun for me to do the three to six and the six to twelve assistance trainings and um i think that they're you know they're expensive but it's a really solid you know 60 hour program and you have to do assignments and you get your hands really on like i was really impressed with even with a virtual um approach we still got the connection of the group we were having to make materials and a song anthology and things like that and i actually just love getting out the books and having to write my 500 word assignments and things like that <laughs> <laughs> you're so you're so fun <laughs> All right. Um, let's, oh, so Andrew, um, Heather, the second part of your question was, how do you respond to a toddler screaming using the Montessori approach? So to me, it's really about that, you know, the compassion and the empathy and getting down to their level, uh, sometimes even below their level, and just letting them know that you see them and that you, you notice that they're having a hard time with something and how can I help you? Uh, and really being there for them not not taking it as it's an offense or or personally they 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 are trying to communicate something remember that that the behavior is always a form of communication so really being um being being compassionate and, and at the same time knowing where the limits are you know if if it's if it gets to be too much where you can't be in the same room it's it's also okay to say you know i see that you're really upset and your screaming is 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 a bit much for me right now i'm going to go take a deep breath and i'll be right back i'm here for you and i want to help you but i need to to take a deep breath first or or something like that because that to me also models you know that it's important to take care of ourselves uh to be able to to help others how would you and I how yeah, I think also what's really interesting is sometimes we want to shout back like, please, like use your quiet voice. But if we just really soften our voice and say, I, I, I hear you. Oh, can you repeat it again in a softer voice so that it doesn't hurt my ears or whatever it is. Like, That's hurting my ears. Let's say it again so it's clearer. I say the same when a child's eating with their mouth full. It's like, I really want to hear what you're saying. Will you say it again when your mouth's empty? Um, and so we can say it in a polite way instead of no, 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 no. And then we end up up escalating it as well um but yes always it's it's communication screaming is some type of message from them that they're um, not happy with the situation and so as much as possible and sometimes it's not available you're not available right that moment and so then you can just be just like a toy i would say it's available soon you can also say I, i'll be available soon i hear you and you can encourage them to put your hand on your shoulder and that means that what they have to say is very important um and you'll get to it as soon as possible so i practice that with children i learned that from the preschool teacher that my children had my children are now 18 years old and 19 years old so this was 15 years ago and um Anne would get the children to put a hand on their shoulder and when she was available then she would ask them you know what they needed help with and it's a really good reminder because if you say oh yeah i'll come back to you forget but when you get this really heavy hand on your shoulder you know oh yes i need i need to give you some attention yeah, and, and i will add also to have some sort of of sometimes we need just a non-verbal communication so it could very well see you know i see you and put your hand on your heart so that they know that you know 
I, I, I'm aware, I know I'm here for you. I'll be here, you know, as, as soon as you, or, or, you know, your hands on your ears because it, it's a little too loud. Um, but definitely not trying to tell them to stop or, or, or shouting back. It's really about understanding that this is just a form of communication and we're just helping them uh, communicate it differently. Yeah. Um, so Adeline says, I do love whispering in here, everything quiet down. Um, yeah. And also just calm the, in your mind. Like I used to think of waves and when I can make them into ripples, then I notice that the classroom tends to calm down. But even, even if it doesn't, I just feel calmer. And so that helps as well. Mm. Um, so Heather says, thank you for the advice. So helpful for my little guy. He's a new big brother. So it's been challenging for him to share the attention that is a big change for him absolutely and then mariana says it's funny how we try to get them not to shout by shouting louder <laughs> we've all been there um and adeline says we're going through the phase where she interrupts and we do hands on hip ah okay so that can work too great um we'll stick with some of the questions that came in first but keep popping your questions in the chat and we'll definitely get to them um Andrea asked, um, what is the next best thing to giving my two-year-old social experiences during this pandemic? Well, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because, you know, the, the, the thing would be to, to do these, but this is not appropriate for, for two-year-olds. So I think it's really, you know, as much as we can to 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 have role play to maybe you know if we can in a safe way meet people uh, outside at the park um, but it, it's 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 challenging because children you know don't want to keep social distance they want to be next to each other and 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 such so uh i don't know that's a tough one what, what, how, how would you yeah, I was just going to say, I think it depends where you're living as well, because here in the Netherlands for children under four, they don't have to keep a distance, but the adults do. So you can like go to the playground and the children can be playing side by side as long as the adults are at a distance. Um, if that's not possible, but it, places are open, like stores and things, is that I would probably try and take them to a store with me. And so they can have social interactions with the person who where you're buying the groceries off. And so you can visit the butcher and you can you know, have these daily conversations because that's also interaction. Um, Zoom calls with grandparents are still just as beneficial as ever. So you can make them more interactive for the child by the grandparents can sing songs, they can read books together and those kind of things. And I also know that people have organized play dates where they just have like an iPad on in the corner and their friends playing and the parents are chatting. And then it's a bit like having a virtual play date, but it's not them sitting in front of the screen. They're just kind of doing side by side play, which is what a two year old kind of does in my classroom is this, they like seeing someone else, but they don't actually necessarily have to play together either. So right. it's definitely improvising, but I think something like that could be really great. Um, maybe you even want to get a pet if you're really up for it, because that's another type of like caring for another um, individual would be caring for a, an animal in your house. And maybe it doesn't have to be a dog or some long commitment, but it could be a goldfish or hamsters have a very short lifespan of a couple of years. So, you know, something like this might be a nice pet to start with. Yeah. And, and also if you have, you know, family members or friends that you know, are, are being safe and you, you're comfortable with meeting up with them, that's, you know, I think uh, to me, that would be, that would be okay. I mean, I know for me, I, I, you know, traveled, I isolated for 14 days and now I'm able to be with my family. <laughs> so things, you know, there, there's, like we said at the beginning of the call, it's like, we're, 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 we're not experts at this. This is all new to us as well. So um, Serena in the chat says my two-year-old doesn't sit in front of a screen or phone for a call for longer than five minutes and no. I don't think they will and so that's okay because actually I don't, don't want them to <laughs> a five minute check-in is better than a nothing check-in particularly with a grandparent or something like that and you can get them to maybe sing a song or read a book or show them something that kind of thing it's just a little pop in and they just are getting to know each other that way yeah it's not ideal yeah. but we're making the best of a bad situation and it might be a long time till things are back to normal at the moment. It's, you know, it's a yep. bit tricky. Um, so Liz also says that as COVID rises in the Netherlands, we're about to welcome a new baby into our world. Do you have any suggestions for supporting our two-year-old daughter through this transition? We don't have any family here and limited social support. 
So this is going to be, and, and I think we've talked this on, on other shows about, you know, welcoming uh, a child and, and this, you know, yes, with the pandemic, it makes it all that much difficult because maybe, you know, even if you did have help, uh, I know it's kind of hard to, to get other people to come into your home or, or even uh, in birthing centers and, and such. But preparing a two-year-old, I think for me, I really tend to to not want to do it too far ahead because their notion of time is 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 a little warped so i would just you know a few weeks before just start really preparing things and clothes and asking for help and i wonder you know what the baby's going to look like and 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 such but for for a two year old i you know i would be mindful not to have too high of expectations because it's 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 going to rock their world at this young of an age and and but it's really about just preparing them that there's going to be another person living in our house and this little human you know isn't going to be able to talk right away and then they might cry and then we'll need to change their diapers and would you like to help and and so forth there's also, I think we had a few books also to recommend. I'll, I'll look for those as well. But I know that we had kind of, you know, uh, waiting for a sibling, uh, being an older sibling uh, books and, and such that would be um, wonderful. Yeah, I think it's actually quite sweet. The babies that have been born in COVID times, um, we have in Montessori um, what we call the symbiotic period for the first six to eight weeks. And this is symbiosis if for those who aren't into biology is when two organisms live in a mutually um, positive relationship you know so in the sea world it could be like a kind of coral and another kind of thing that feeds off each other and they're you know living symbiotically and in Dr. Montessori in the Montessori world we talk about it's the family getting to know each other and so Actually, when life is simpler and we don't have people coming and visiting, we have this beautiful opportunity to get to know each other in the new formation. And it can be messy. Like there's going to be days I remember trying to breastfeed my son and getting um, and get a, my sorry breastfeed my daughter and get my son a glass of milk at the same time just because there was just no more waiting and that was kind of like a messy day and then the other days you know there were just a lot of laughs and um life can slow down a little bit which makes it easier for that transition and the baby to get into to adjust from the inside in utero to the outside world where everything's a lot bigger noisier and when life can be simpler you know, so look at the upsides, I guess, as well. I love all Jean-Marie's suggestions. Um, here in the Netherlands, we are very lucky to have Kromzorgs, which um, is a person who can come into your home for the first 10 days. And hopefully that's still possible um, when your baby's born. And they help um, settle you in. And that what's really nice about that is that they can give you time, sometimes can look after the baby while you have one-on-one -on -one time with the older child. So I try and schedule that in as well to make some special time with the older one when the baby's you know, asleep or someone else is looking after them. Make a list on your fridge for what the crumbs all can do to look after um, so that you know you don't have to worry about delegating things. That's what they're there for. And, 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 and for me, I just want to say just one word for the, the mother is to, to be very mindful to take good care of yourself during this period too. Because I, I know we tend to worry about our older children Children adapting and, and such, but you're going to need to get some rest and 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 such. So get at least support from your parenting partner, and if you have friends that can come over and you know help you cook and clean and things like that, is is really important to to learn to ask for help in these in these times. So Liz, we're wishing you all the best. And there's a few other people in the chat who are expecting babies too. So um, hopefully those tips will be- Yes, I want to have a, a shout out to Adeline who has been uh, a, she's been on the Montessori show, I think from the very beginning, Adeline. Yeah. And, 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 and I remember you sharing with the, the birth of your daughter and now you are expecting your second one. So it's just wonderful to, to have you here and to, to know that uh, your daughter is, is already excited to have her sibling come along. So that's wonderful. Yeah, Adeline says she sings to my belly and is um, super willing to let go of certain toys. She says it for the baby. And she says she's gonna take the baby to help me and put it 
put it on her bed to sleep. Which is <laughs> nice. um, and then Michaela also says, um, Selena, could, could you have your two-year-old help you with the tasks for the baby? Maybe she needs to feel responsible for something, having it bring you clothes when you change the baby and things like that. Yeah. So they're all great ideas. And, and for me, it's also um, questioning, asking the older child, like, what do you think the baby needs? Like really having them tell you what they think uh, they need can be, can be really empowering for, for that sibling as well. And, and they tend to sometimes understand what the babies need more than we do, I feel. So. Yeah, great. I have to look up the link for someone about the AMI training and I'll definitely, if I don't get a chance during the call, I'll, I'll add it into the show notes for you all. Um, so back to our list of questions. Um, did you need to ask, what is the future of Montessori classes in current growing COVID pandemic? <laughs> yes. uh, I don't know. I mean, I have hopes. I have hopes of really taking time to ponder on what the children need more than anything. You know, I'm, I, I do worry about getting too digital and that, that, that we're depending more on screens. But I know a lot of the Montessori elders and leaders and, and Simone and I have been attending some of the uh, kind of these forums where we've been discussing this. And there's some wonderful ideas really of empowering parents to do Montessori at home and really helping them with um, how to create material, how to use it and such. So I think we're just going to be really mindful to, uh, you know, Montessori for me is really about adapting. It's really about adapting to our time, place, and culture. And I think right now we are being asked to adapt to this situation that we've we're, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of taken by surprise and we're having to do it in a very mindful, loving way. And um, so that's, I, I hope that, you know, Montessori will rise to that occasion. And, and I know, I know most of the colleagues that I talk to are, are concerned and are thinking of how they can best support uh, children and families. There's a really sweet comment in the chat um, from Little Orchard Montessori School. As a school owner and AMS primary lead teacher, I see everyone going back to normal in the school and classrooms. I don't see any real changes in the Montessori classroom with um, in the long term. Oh, wonderful! That's good so news. That's yeah, nice to hear. Um, I think it is interesting though because I in my classroom at the moment we're not doing snack time, for example in the way that we used to do it because um, children just are sharing, there's so much room to cross contaminate and it's just a difficult time to do that. Um, and I feel like we really miss out. So I'm kind of thinking about how I can support families to make sure they're gonna be doing that at home instead. Um, I think the needs of the children don't change, but the situation changes, you know, and that's how, why I would say that the Montessori approach still applies 150 years later is that the, um, child, the characteristics of children haven't changed and it's just our time, place, as you say, and culture that changes or, you know, is slightly different in um, every time there's a new generation of children. Um, and so when we look at the human tendencies, um, I love to go back to that and say children need to move, they need to communicate, they need to explore and orientate, and they need a sense of order. And how, and even as adults, we are humans, right? We still have those tendencies too. So even in our limited space, how can you have freedom to explore? That's why I think we're doing a lot of professional development and online learning because we can't go out and take dance classes right now. So we need to learn and explore in other ways. We can't explore countries. And so we need to take interest into other areas. Um, some of us have taken up puzzles and handwork and other things because that's our sense of it. So I think going back to the needs of children, you can apply Montessori principles. If it's actually about Montessori classes, I hope that they will be able to keep running as much as possible. And I think many governments don't want to close down schools like they originally did because it really has an economic impact on you know, the workforce as well. So um, for those countries that are able to go back to school, I think that that's been great. What I've noticed is I'm wearing a mask in my classroom and the children just look at me. They look a bit strange. The preschool is definitely saying to me like, why, why, why? And then they get back onto the, the, the thing and right. they totally look at me for a moment and then they 
just absorb it as normal. So, um, and, and then they're all doing all the work as they are. They don't notice that there's a pandemic going on. Yeah, I actually saw the other day, and I'm trying to remember the the name of the the woman who did them. But it, it, they were emotion cards, you know, the the facial expressions, but they were with a mask. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, this these smiling eyes and these angry eyes. But it was all the same kind of emotion language cards, but with adapted to what we're seeing today, which is, you know, with a mask. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, for me, I don't believe it's going to alter Montessori to, to, you know, to answer that specific question. I think we're learning to adapt to the situation as well. Um, there's also some beautiful examples of outside um, schools because actually Montessori can be applied outdoors and then you have less restrictions and those kind of things. So there's a school in Norway, which we featured in the Montessori Everywhere event um, that was an outside school and how they're dealing with it and everyone having their own backpacks and, you know, washing hands like we're great at hand washing. So, you know, these kind of things are already built into our class. Um, I think the elementary children would have the most trouble with it because they love group work. And if elementary children can't sit you know, close to each other to collaborate and they're messy and they sprawl out, that would be difficult to do at a distance, but maybe they could all have their own mat to mark their one and a half meters distance and they're still collaborating, but in a, you know, extended space. Um, I'll add some links to the show notes as well. Like I know the AMS have got some resources on their website for COVID. Um, and then we've also got Monastery Friends who wrote a book about um, Montessori in challenging times. So that could, I can link that as well. Um, Adeline says we do extra sanitizing and we monitor symptoms fast and ask parents to keep their children. Um, nothing else has changed for us. So yeah, that's the same. We're doing wiping down toys a lot <laughs> um, between, to, between use and those kind of things as well. And we have the windows wide open as if we're outside. Um, and Michaela says, yes, sense of order is so strong. I worked with, during shutdown here in France with zero to three children. It really helps when the little ones and adults know what's coming up in the day and have a schedule and communicate it to the children. It was very helpful. I do. I do think the families that are doing the best are the ones that look the night before what's going to happen and then they've got a routine going and they... Yes also manage between if there's a partner involved, you know, what calls have you got today? What calls have you got? Who's going to be in charge of the children, the home, you know, any yeah. of those kind of things as well. Yeah. Um, I think this is a great question that came in by Insta and uh, they wrote, I would rather hear about parenting challenging children <laughs> than parenting in challenging times. So Jean-Marie and I laughed at that and then said, well, what Maybe that's a good topic for the next one. So what does everyone think? It, it is. Talking children. It is. And, and I just kind of, I, I love that that person asked that because for me, I know it when I first started working in the classroom and, and I'll be perfectly honest with everybody. I used to, I used to really kind of back away from wanting to, to deal with the parents. Like the children were fine. Just drop off your children. Let me, let me, um, work with them and it's it's oftentimes us as parents who bring our anxiety our worries and all this to the children so i think you know when when we for example the the conscious parent uh, dr shafali's book about really looking at our our own self and our own uh maybe childhood wounds or or such we will be a better parent uh to our child so definitely we can do a whole show on that but I, I just think that that was a really top uh really good question so thank you whoever asked that one um i've just found the link so i'll pop that one into the chat box about the ami courses and um serena says yeah yes children are just being themselves and handling them is challenging for us parents absolutely agree um and we'll come back to all of the other questions that are coming in in the chat very exciting. Um, okay. The, this is another question that came in from Instagram, which I thought was really interesting is the two year old is very scared of the outside world after being at home for seven months. Any advice? Go slow, go slow. This is, this is again, you know, new and, and, you know, I, as an adult, I, I'm noticing I'm having different reactions about wanting to, to go out. Here I am in, in Paris. In normal times, I would be at museums every single day and going to galleries and such. And 
I'm a little apprehensive. I'm, I'm, I'm being vigilant. I live with, um, you know, my elder parents. So I'm being very conscientious about where, where I go and such. So I think with children who haven't been out and who can feel also our anxiety and who are, who are hearing things, um, you know, probably unbeknownst to us whether when we're listening to the radio or if we're watching news or things or or conversation among ourselves so they're they're aware they've got their little antennas out so it's just taking it slow and 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 being okay with them being scared and and really you know again it's that whole notion of of having compassion and saying, I, I understand. And, and this is, you know, we're, we're going to get used to it again and we're going to take it one step at a time. I think they're also picking up a lot of cues from us and how we're dealing with the situation. Exactly. They're, they're picking up our anxiety. So we're almost best to work on ourselves to make sure that we feel confident. So the same principles would apply when you first drop off your child to daycare or to, a nursery or school, you know, they'll pick up if we feel confident with the space that they're going through. So are you feeling confident with the situation that you're putting your child in? Because actually, if they walk out of the street, other than masks on, a two-year-old won't really notice anything different. So it's clear that they're picking up messages. Also, they haven't had maybe a lot of social contact. So maybe it's just like, oh, these are people I haven't seen. So when people come to my classes and a parent says, my child's a little bit shy, not wanting to label them, but you know, they're a little nervous. Then I actually say, I know this seems kind of intuitive and you want to encourage them in the space. But what I would rather you do is spend at least 20 minutes just sitting on the side with your child between your legs. And then when they just cannot help themselves, but touch something, they will walk away from you. And whenever we do this and we invest a little bit of time to go at the child's pace and not push them and make them feel uncomfortable, because then they just tend to cling to want to cling closer. So I think that if you just sat on the, um, I don't know if you have a sidewalk kind of thing. Like I'm just thinking of my steps in Amsterdam where I would just sit on the steps at our front door and just get used to people walking past. And then I might, you know, take them to the store and back with me if I felt like it was okay. And then I might, or being in a playground where there's a lot of space and just building up the little things at a time to make them get used to and finding out also being curious about wonder why they're scared of being outside. Maybe they're actually so, they've been inside so much, they're not really even used to the trams and the traffic. And there could be hundreds of things that they're not used to anymore. And imagine that sensory input from everything if you've really been locked in for such a long time. So I think that would be one thing I'd be really conscious of is that as much as possible, can you get out in a safe way to an outside space so that your children aren't being completely locked off from the outside world as yes. much as possible? Yes, and and the whole obs observing with them, I think, is really important. And and thank you, Giovanni, says that he finds all three of Shafali's books very helpful for Montessori teachers. And and it's true. I had um, I I spoke with her once about how to me her her approach is very much what we are taught as Montessori teachers is the whole spiritual preparation of the adult, and and it's the same thing for for the parents, right? We need to prepare ourselves to, to be with children. So that, that was a side note, but yes, very much in line with Montessori. Um, this is a great one too, Inst but also by Instagram. How to explain to a two-year-old about the present and ask them to be careful about touching surfaces. So how do you talk to them about COVID and those kind of things? So for me there, personally, a two-year-old, I wouldn't necessarily talk specifically about COVID. It's just this is this is what we're doing now. It's just we're being careful about where uh, we're adapting to our time, right? It's it's just we're we're being vigilant. So we're just saying, you know, when we touch something that is we haven't touched before, we need to wash our hands, or um, you know, being mindful not to put our hands on our face and things like that. Um, that would be me. You know, I wouldn't necessarily go into the specifics of of COVID and the global pandemic and the virus and all of this, but more just kind of modeling what it is that we do now and that we wipe surfaces down and we wash our hands and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that a lot of children who I've been in contact with, they know that there's a virus, you know, that's okay. 
virus some people can get quite sick from it so we're taking extra care to keep everyone safe and trying not to make it like a like that we have to be scared of the virus but we're keeping everyone safe and then when we don't have to take so much precaution i think they're going to be fine with going back to not washing their hands quite so much um and i think that it's going to be very hard to stop a child from touching services so my opposite mine would be the opposite is just like that we just wash hands a lot more often and yet yeah, we have a mask on maybe so they can't get their their faces touched they might want to take the masks off um and it's going to be messy and not exactly precise luckily i think for us in this situation covid isn't uh, the children are the ones that are spreading the covid as much or getting it in such a serious way which is you know a bit of a blessing in disguise but um it means that we can just lay down good hygiene um, exactly without, as says going overboard with uh, making it fear, fearful and scary that we don't want to touch things right right yeah um, there's one more from Instagram and then I'd love to answer some of the questions in the chat, but um, they said how to make new friends as a stay at home mom and surround myself with support. So exactly what we're doing tonight is to reach out to like minded um, parents, uh, friends. So there's, you know, plenty of different groups now there's actually you know memberships uh and things like that but i would just i would organize you know be be an organizer of of maybe people that you've met before and that you uh enjoy chatting with them and and send them a text and say hey would you be up for you know having a social hour on zoom and i know it sounds kind of strange but this is the way that um this is the way, you know, today of how to, to find that support. I know I had to do that for myself. I, you know, I live in San Diego. All my family is in France. And at the beginning of the confinement, I felt very um, kind of, you know, a little bit worried and, and, and distant. And we actually put together a Sunday Zoom call and we actually still have it today. And it's been wonderful. It's like it was a blessing because I actually never talked to my family as much as I did during those, you know, three months of, of confinement. And and we've kept it up and I did the same thing with some friends. Um, so I think it's it's just important to to ask for that like to not be shy to to ask for it and to reach out and then you know now uh meet up used to be some uh, a group that you could find uh you know like-minded people outdoors now they actually uh, have it online doing zoom as well um if you are on facebook there's some wonderful uh facebook communities or memberships or things like that and I think that if you don't know any mums um, already before you went into lockdown, um, then a lot of um, areas like in Amsterdam, so we have Amsterdam mamas. And so all of the parents asking questions there and you could organize something like that. But also having like if you're into books, like online book clubs are really like a fun way, because I think that sometimes parenting, it's nice to get parenting support, but it's also nice to have friends that aren't necessarily even related um, to children, you know, so you can have your own interests or yeah, if you like gardening or um, maybe music learning. or singing, whatever. Yeah. 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 Then having, then those kind of things can also support you. Um, don't forget your family. If you're still, in, you know, in touch with your family that they would love to, like Jean-Marie says, have online um, kind of conversations with you and your family and um, no. those kind of things. Um, and maybe even just locally, your the local businesses are doing online things at the moment that you can connect that way, like some prenatal yoga, that's a prenatal yoga group that um or postnatal group sorry that um would have um you could get to know some other parents that way and then maybe you could suggest that afterwards you have a virtual coffee or something like that and and i will say just a word of caution about parenting groups that are out there like look around you know don't don't that you might you know have to try a few before you find your kind of something that is that that really speaks to you like don't if there's any you know any group that that uh you feel judged in anywhere to me that that's not a supportive one so just look around be make sure that it's it's feels good to you great 
All right, I'm just going back in the chat um, and there's a question here. Do you see challenges with homeschooling children that are coming home from public school knowing that they aren't challenged during the day and filling in the gaps when they're tired and just want to be home? Any suggestions? So wait, you're, you're, I, I didn't understand that question. That's okay. It says, do you see challenges with homeschooling children that are coming home from public school, knowing that they're not challenged during the day and filling in the gaps when they're tired and just want to be home? Any suggestions? So I guess it's about how to be at home with kids who are in a public school, but wanting to maybe introduce Montessori at home. So I would be, you know, I would let them be tired and let them recuperate. I think, uh, you know, the public school often, the, the whole homework thing and, and all of that um, can be a little bit too much. And yes, maybe they're not being challenged, but I think that you can challenge them just through conversations and maybe more, you know, doing um, outings or research or uh, projects on the weekend, like don't feel that it needs to be daily. Uh, because I think, you know, if they are coming home and they are tired, they need time to recuperate and then have those conversations of, you know, is there something that you wanted to know more about today? And do you, you know, or what was what was something that was that was intriguing to you and, and, you know, we need to do a little bit more research or things like that so that it's really child led. So it's really about following the child and not you, you know, feeling that they're not being challenged enough and wanting to put more on their plate. I, cause I'm also reluctant to teach them how to read in a different way than they're learning at school exactly. or already doing more mathematics and those kind of things. But what I would, what I've kind of said about unschooling and what I think at home, it's like learning through play anyway. And so baking is great because they're measuring ingredients and they're learning when it goes wrong and um, it, going outside and being in nature and making discoveries and nature collections and then bringing those things home um, and making art with them or mandalas or, you know, many things. So I think it's um, not necessarily about them doing more schoolwork, but more curiosity about the world and, it depends on the age of the child how big that would be because in the toddler world it's just really their local environment and then as it becomes a school age child the preschooler they're interested in other cultures and other places on the world and then all of a sudden it's the universe isn't it so mm -hmm. um, it's the, it just gets bigger and bigger um and your question about after the great lessons what extensions do you do after that now, neither Jean-Marie or I are as elementary trained teachers, so we will pass on that one. But definitely, um, if you're interested to do 6 to 12 training or there's um, some of the homeschooling groups, and there's also a lovely Facebook group um, about for elementary children as well. Um, and I can share, I can share actually a link also of a friend, uh, Pilar, who is doing a specifically a elementary uh, homeschooling group and she's she has a membership that she started and is is really you know talking about the great lessons and what you can do afterwards and everything so that might be interesting and I know that there is uh, a workshop on that also in that homeschooling summit I was talking about earlier so we'll, we'll share all those links Okay, so this is a longer comment. So let's see if we can break it down. Um, this is from Selena. There are certain times when cooperation is required, like when it comes to safety. Can you please share tips? Like if the lockdown starts again, I'll be home with two kids rather than just after nursery. Um, for example, when I'm at home looking after my two um, years, three month old and four month old, the 2.3 year old climbs everything, the tables, chairs, and leaning on the back of them, climbing the bookshelf, etc. What can you do? Because she just laughs and continues um, get down on her level and speak in a firm but caring voice um the bookshelf is for your books not for climbing briefly explain why tell them you care for them and that's why there needs to be limits no compromise on safety give other options remove them saying would you like me to remove your body or would you simply remove them tried all this but she just continues laughing also speaking about it later in a calm setting what else can you do aside from remove, rearrange furniture? Because sometimes there are limits on that and you have already gone out. 
Hmm, that uh, sounds like you have a two, two and a half year old that's wanting a lot of attention and, and, and you know, needs that uh, redirecting. So I would, you know, maybe try to plan ahead when you need to take care of that four month old to have something that she can really do near you that is going to engage her. So maybe save some of the uh, activities that you would maybe do at a different time of day that you know she's going to enjoy so that she can be near you and doing something else because right now it sounds like maybe she's a little bit bored when you're taking care of your four month old and you know this is her way of letting you know that um maybe also you know, piling up a bunch of, of big pillows in the middle of the room and all this so that there is a safe place to have those big movements that she's, she's needing to have because climbing is, you know, is definitely a big need in our children. So being able to create something safe and, and letting her know, I see that you're, you know, really wanting to climb and, and I, I have to keep you safe. Remember there's, there's a, a way that I love to say is saying that my job is to keep you safe and, and, and climbing on the bookshelf is, is not, is not safe. So let's build something that is safe for you to jump and, and, and climb and, and such. And if at all, if you are able to go outside, make sure that she gets a lot of climbing in <laughs> as much as possible, go in the woods and, you know, climb and, 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 and all of that. Uh, but the, the idea of really having something for her to be engaged in that she enjoys doing while you're taking care of the four month old would, would probably help with that. Yeah, I think it's really difficult because um, you've, I think many of the things that you've said, um, would, it would be how we would approach it, you know, like it's not safe and we're putting you down here and I'm giving you other alternatives. Um, and she laughs and when they laugh, it just triggers us because we feel like they're not taking it seriously. So the only advice I can say on that part is to still just follow through in your kind and clear way and try not to react to the laughing because then that just encourages them even more. And it also maybe shows that she's like trying to see, does this limit still apply today? Does it still apply in right now? And does it still apply right now? And you're just reminding her, yeah, it's my job to keep you safe. Yeah, no, I'm putting you down. Mm -hmm. And um, having many obstacle courses and things like that, I'll even add a link to the show notes. We were creating obstacle courses in my classroom and I was also I was doing it in my classroom and everyone was doing it in their house making obstacle courses and we got lots of ideas for how to create very simple things like you can cut out footprint shapes and things like that so maybe you could create an obstacle course for her to explore I um, mean I just re like I only had so many things in my classroom but I tried to challenge myself to come up with a different one every class so I did eight versions and so you could just keep using the same things you have but in new ways I was rolling up the carpet to make something for like a balance beam. And the next time that it was out and that was the water that was safe. And, you know, so you can get pretty, pretty creative. <laughs> um, and just wish you best of luck with all of that. Um, so now. Any other questions that are, are coming up? And if you do want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to, to ask it live if you're here. Um, so yes. has a question here. Do you have any ideas for how to bring these methods to adult, adult children whose parenting skills are not really child oriented is loud. Um, you'll be fine. Time out approach. Hmm. Not quite sure. Are you on the call? Is this person oh, on the call? Probably is. But um, I think it, what it means is like, how do you deal with other people you know, parenting or like looking after your child in a not monstery way. They're used to time out and being loud and, and those kind of things. And that's a lot of the work that Jean-Marie and I do with parents is like, and it's a very gradual process because people don't like to be told that the way they're doing it's wrong. So if you're, for example, a grandparent, they get very offended. Like, didn't I raise you okay? Like, you know, they get first defensive. So it's really coming mostly. I do a lot of work. By oh, modeling Scott is like, clear. Oh, Scott's here. Perfect. Yes. Hi. 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 My question is more um, as grandparents that have um, more of a, uh, I don't want to say progressive, but um, child oriented approach to child 
child rearing than your than your um, adult children. Okay. And it, both my both my husband and I are really um, bothered by this, and it's just so hard. It's such a sensitive subject. Um, yes. We get a lot of resistance and anger. And 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 unfortunately, I think that um, sometimes you know it it's we can we I think we can we can share that it 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 uh, you know it triggers us or that I see that, you know, you're maybe resisting my approach or things like that. But I know, I know for myself and, and I'll speak very personally, you know, here I am a Montessori trained teacher. I've done positive discipline. I'm a mindful um, parenting mentor. And I see my brothers and sisters, you know, doing things or talking to their children in ways that sometimes make me cringe, but I, I have not been asked for advice, so I have to observe and I cannot, I, I don't feel like it is my place to step in unless I am asked for things. So I think you can be a wonderful role model of how you speak to your grandchildren in front of your adult children and really, you know, show your way, but to, to impose our ways you know, I think it's, it's going to be more, more resistance uh, from them. So it's really more about you just, just modeling and trusting that you're modeling and seeing how the children are, are reacting positively to, to the way you're dealing with them will help your adult children maybe ask for advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think also like looking at ways everyone learns in different ways. And so mm -hmm. I went in my classes, I do modeling, but I also make videos. I make a podcast. I write newsletters. Um, we do calls like this where people can interact. And so like your adult children, what are the ways that they're, mo are they visual kind of people? Are they more oral? Because you could send them a podcast link oh, I heard this really thing. Like, you know how you were having trouble at the dinner last night and I just heard this and I found it really helpful. So you could refer mm -hmm. them to like my podcast. Jean-Marie has a podcast. Um, Janet Lansbury has a podcast about children's behavior as well. That's really helpful. Um, so maybe those kind of things help. And in the chat, yeah. there's also someone saying that they, it's the other way around the hardest is handling co-parents or grandparents that aren't calm enough to handle a situation. And then again, mm -hmm. I say that it's often modeling because a tantrum, for example, is dealt with in a very different way. Like, yeah, one person's punishing the child going into a tantrum, putting them into timeout, and another's like helping the child first calm down and then helping them make amends right. when it's done. And we know which, we, which mm -hmm. approach we prefer as Montessori, you know, educators and parents, um, but it's a very different way. And it's take, it takes a very long time. What I see with for most people, it takes a long time to shift. And it's like layers of an onion where maybe they just stop saying good job. That could be the first step, you know, because that's something that's a little bit easier to change than really mm -hmm. an angry personality and being reactive. And yeah, there's a whole lot of things. <laughs> but uh, kudos to you. Kudos to you to being that grandparent who's showing the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Okay, Any, we've, I've closed the questions now. I saw one from Tajinda at the end. Let's have a look. It says, how should we react to a three and a half year old hitting us, our mom and dad, out of frustration? You take that hand firmly and say, I cannot let you hurt me. I, I, I cannot let you hurt me. And, and I need to keep everybody safe. It's, it's, it's again, it's always that, that loving firmness, the kind and firmness of really setting your boundaries of this is not okay and I will not let you do this to me. So really, you know, repeating that and being very firm and not, you know, the, 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 I, I think we always tend to say, you can't do that or you're not allowed to do that. But the thing is, is they are doing it. They, they're, they're in the motion, they're doing it. So it's really more those I messages of, I can't let you hit me. I don't like being hit. And, and, and such. So really the, the I messages. Yeah. Um, and Reese adds on to that, like, and what if she hits herself? Like, so similar to hitting parents, what if they're hitting themselves out of frustration? 
Um, there again, for me, it's going to be, you know, my job is to keep everybody safe and, and, you know, how can, let's, let's be gentle, you know, give, give, give your, yourself a nice hug and, and, and things like that. But again, you know, if, if there is hitting, it's a form of communication. So it's, it's, again, it's trying to, to unravel and, and decipher what it is, what is that frustration that is, is leading her to, to, to want to, to to hit and it's really hard because there's a need that's not being met and we're also not allowing the behavior so it's allow all um expression like let them have their emotions but you i'm not going to let you hit me you sound really frustrated i really want to help you and i'm not going to let you hit me so let's do angry things on it should we get some paper and draw angry things i mean so once in my classroom i've started banging on a pillow like this and the child just looked at me like huh what's she doing because i wanted them to like maybe physically get it out rather than push another child because because um, they're not really trying to be naughty. They're really trying to express something. And they probably just don't like what they heard, which is like, you're not allowed to do that. Or, um, and we can't be there. We also have our own limits. So we are already really child focused, but I also think Montessori is about having everyone's needs met, including the parents. So if you're finishing your meal, and they're hitting at you, you're like, oh, I see you really want someone to play with and I'm finishing my meal, you know? what? Well, and then you can give them a choice about what they might like to do while you're finishing your meal, but that's not, you know, hurting someone as well. And, 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 uh, and also just, you know, try to remind yourself as much as you can to not take these acts personally. Like it's not a personal attack. It's just the child trying to communicate something. And I think, you know, when we're being hit, it, it you know, it's an offense to us. So we, we take it personally, but if we can stay in that position of I'm here to support you, I'm here to help you, you know, figure out what it is you're, you're frustrated about, like, you know, you don't need to use those words with them, but, but, but reacting from that place of not taking it like it's an offense to you personally will really, really help you stay calm and patient with them. Yes. And Michaela reminds us to go back to observation as in what's triggering them in the first place. Exactly. Yes. And all those things. So thank you everyone for all your questions. I can see more questions coming in, but we are going to have to stop there and uh, let you all get back to your days. Um, Jean-Marie, you've got some things coming up. You have a part of this homeschooling summit. So yes, I, I've been mentioning it, but this is something that was put together by uh, Catherine from, I believe in Montessori and then Yula from oh, motherhood something. But anyway, two homeschooling mothers who have put together this summit and we are several um, people who have come together and done master classes for you. So that uh, the tickets are already on sale and we'll put the link in the show notes, but that will be starting October 5th. And I think that for all of you who, you know, had homeschooling uh, questions would be a great place to, to come and learn. And it's going to be really for children from about three to nine, I would say. So primary and uh, lower elementary children. Brilliant. And tomorrow evening, or oh, well, Amsterdam time anyway, around this time, I'm going to be running, hosting a workshop that Sarah Muji is doing. Um, she's wonderful. She's from the studio June and she's going to be doing a workshop all about Montessori and food. So if you want to learn more about having children build independence in the kitchen, um, about calm, building calm meal times, um, any picky eaters and things like that, we're going to be talking about all those kind of things. So you'll be welcome to join that and I'll pop a link in the show notes for that as well. Um, I think other than that, um, we're going to be back in a few months, probably in the new year for the next yes. show. Um, now that you're on the list, um, you'll get an invitation to join us for the next one. Um, with a new topic. Um, thank you to everyone who's dropping all their notes of thanks in the chat box. We had um, <laughs> Celine is saying thank you so much. And is there oh, something even up here? There was another one. Um, this is my first time joining the call. It's been so helpful and amazing. Thank you for this great advice and just lots oh, of wonderful lovely messages. Thank you. And just everyone. and 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 where where we put all of these shows are all archived on YouTube on on the Montessori Show channel. So there's plenty there also to go back and and watch if you're looking for specific answers as well. 
And maybe it would be fun to like get you into breakout rooms to do the discussions as well yourself. So that was one of the fun things about Montessori Everywhere is that that's true. Yeah. you're Montessori trained, but you also have a lot of wisdom within yourselves. And so it's also nice, like a Montessori way is for older children to teach younger children and for us to share knowledge. And I think that it could be fun that maybe that's we a do great it idea. Yeah. as well. So yeah. maybe we could, um, would anyone be keen on that kind of idea where you go into the breakout rooms and you discuss yourselves? You can let us know. Yes. Um, yes. So yes, um, the, re- the YouTube channel is the Montessori um, show. Is that yes. right? Yes, and the Montessori we'll show. Link- yeah, so we'll put a link in the show notes to this one um, week's um, show and then you can go back into the archive for the last four and a half years. We have topics on everything from... Gosh, what haven't we covered, to be honest? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> there was yeah. everything from minimalism was one, which was really fun. And we did, I mean, there's lots of positive discipline ones and dealing with tantrums, uh, preschoolers, toddlers. And sleeping. Rye, Junifer had done one on, on Rye and welcoming a baby and all this. So there, there's plenty uh, for you to, to have. Oh, somebody put in the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And then we've got some different languages coming through. Arigato, yes. because I'm much <laughs> close. I don't know. Yes. We're getting close. Alrighty. Thank you, friends. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful seeing you. Bye bye. Bye bye. You're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, say goodbye if you like. Yes. I can. Goodbye. Thank bye. you. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Massachusetts. Alrighty. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, Kiyoko. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Alrighty. Take care, everybody. Bye, Jean-Marie. Bye-bye.